This is this is this is. Welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast. Hope you guys are doing well. So I'm recording this before I go play with Goldfinger, but you're going to be hearing this after the shows. I hope the shows were great. I'm sure they were. I hope you guys had a good time. Anybody that came out, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate you guys. Um, you know, there was a couple other things. Seahawks. Seahawks just played their first playoff game. The Seahawks made the playoffs. I was so happy. I know that they're not the best team in the league right now. Let's just hope as I'm talking into the future that they won. But ah, it's going to be a rough one. It's going to be a rough one. They're playing the uh, San Francisco 49ers who have become a really good team the last half of this season. And um, I, I'm not going to make any predictions. I don't know. It's already happened. I'm good with it. I was just happy to get another game, uh, watching the game in the dressing room in Anaheim at the show at the House of Blues. That's what I assume I did, um, assuming I had some sort of signal where I could watch on my phone or maybe find a TV or something like that. But there's been a lot of a lot of uh, sporting events we've had to find places back in when when the Seahawks won not won went to their first Super Bowl. Spoiler alert: we lost. We played the Pittsburgh Steelers, and the year was 2000. I want to say it was 2005, 2007, 2004. I, I don't know. It was somewhere in there. Um, <laughs> I probably remember better if we won. But I remember the Seahawks were doing really well. We started watching all the playoffs, and we were on tour in Europe. So we were watching playoffs games. We watched the the, the championship semifinal, like the last, the last playoff game before the Super Bowl. We watched that in Germany. Uh, I think it was Berlin, Germany. Super late at night, like 3 in the morning or something like that, 3.30. Um, and then we went to, when by the time the next week, or I think it's the next week is the Super Bowl, we were in, in the UK. We had left Europe, gone to the UK. We were in London, and we found a sports bar, an American sports bar. And, uh, sorry. And we, uh, we went in there and it was like, I think the game started at two thirty, three thirty, somewhere in there, you know, like late again. And we were watching the game, you know, until the sun came up and, and we lost. And there was some other Americans in there, fans of Pittsburgh, for sure. Pittsburgh was the, the, the lucky, the favorite to win for sure. We were the underdogs, but it was a fun time. It was fun to just experience it and just to, you know, and I think, I think um, after that is when I probably wrote those lyrics to Gimme Christmas where I, I say, my favorite team, the Seahawks win the Super Bowl. Yeah, so um, good memories for sure. Anyway, so years later, we actually did end up winning the Super Bowl. Um, we beat the pants off of the Denver Broncos and Peyton Manning just got his ass handed to him it was his probably one of his worst games ever and um i'm a fan of peyton he's a great guy i don't know him personally but just from watching him be do his thing you know it's like that guy's cool you know that that's that's a that's a good dude right there but um we beat the crap out of denver and i've been slapped for it you know i wore my seahawks jersey a few times on stage but right after we won the super bowl against denver we played a show like a month or two later in denver and I wore my jersey, and I went up close to the stage, at, to the front of the stage, and this girl just goes smack and just slaps me right in the face. Man, I was just like, what? <laughs> I was laughing. It was so funny. I was like, you know, I, I deserve that. Yeah, okay, all right, I'll take that. <laughs> ah, good time. I love doing that kind of stuff. It's so much fun. I love wearing jerseys and whatever. But um, uh, Seahawks, yeah. Well, I'm just talking... Out of my bunghole right now because I don't know if they won or lost miserably, but um, whatever, whatever happened, you know, I'm 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 just happy and proud, and, and it was a fun season, and looking forward to watching the rest of uh, the NFL playoffs and the Super Bowl and all that. I'm I'm a fan for sure. So, huh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, I'm been I've been reading before we get to voicemail. I've been reading this book. I'm done with it now. I actually just finished it last night, and it's called The Circle by Dave Eggers. He's the author. And my wife's read a couple of his books. Um, um, heartbreaking. 
work of Staggering Genius. That's one of his books. Um, there's a couple other ones that sound real, real nice. Um, but I, this is really the first, I think the first novel I ever read by Dave Eggers. But I want, it's such a crazy book. I mean, the cra- for me, because I'm, I'm very much in tune with um, companies and corporations and governments being, I don't know, over, you know, overseen and taking privacy away and, and, and spying, you know, how, how the NSA spies on all, all their phone calls and, and knows where you go, can follow your smartphone everywhere. I think pretty sure that's how they found that Brian guy that's been accused of uh, the murders in Moscow, Idaho. Now, if you don't know anything about these murders, let's don't worry about it. Like, just do your thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can find people pretty easily. So it's kind of weird when you when you can't be found, like when, when somebody does something really bad and the police are like, I don't know, uh, we can't find them. It's like, come on, you find people so easily when you really, really need to. Um, I don't know. But let me let me read the synopsis. Let me read the description of this book. Uh I don't know if I, re- I mean, I don't not recommend it to anybody, anybody that's interested in this. Let me just read read the description and you can decide for yourself. But, um, all right, here we go. By the way, it's an international bestseller. <laughs> A best-selling dystopian novel that tackles surveillance, privacy, and the frightening intrusions of technology in our lives. A compulsively readable parable for the 21st century. Absolutely. That, that's a great description. I'll read more. Um, but I'm not against, uh, I'm not against, you know, being tracked on certain things or people knowing where I'm going to be or something like that. It's just, I think if you choose or want to be private and live a private life, you should be able to without being off the grid. But really the only way to not be tracked and not be constantly bugged by like having people send you emails, having people send you text messages. Hey, I want to buy your house on a text message. Hey, uh, did you vote for this candidate on a text? Like, who are you and why are you on my phone? Like crazy stuff. So let me read more of this description. Uh, When May Holland is hired to work for The Circle, the world's most powerful internet company, she feels she's been given the opportunity of a lifetime. The Circle run out of a sprawling California campus, links users' personal emails, social media, banking, and purchasing with their universal operating system, resulting in one online identity and a new age of civility and transparency. Yeah, 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 yeah. As May tours the open plan office spaces, the towering glass dining facilities, the cozy dorms for those who spend nights at work, she is thrilled with the company's modern, oh, so modernity, modernity, sorry, I haven't read, I don't know if I've ever read that out loud before, you know, you, you read things in your head and you just gloss past them, <laughs> modernity, it sounds like maternity, but it's modernity, it means like modern things, I, I assume, um, okay, let me move on, and activity, okay, so th- there are parties that last through the night, There are famous musicians playing on the lawn. There are athletic activities and clubs and brunches and even an aquarium of rare fish retrieved from the Marianas Trench by the CEO. Sounds like a great place. Um, uh, Sorry, May can't believe her luck, her great fortune to work for the most influential company in the world. Even as life beyond the campus grows distant, even as a strange encounter with a colleague leaves her shaken, even as her role at the circle becomes increasingly public. What begins as the captivating story of one woman's ambition and idealism soon becomes a heart-racing novel of suspense, raising questions about memory, history, privacy, democracy, and the limits of human knowledge. Now, that's, in, that's the end of the description, but it's a fascinating book. It talks about there's so many parallels. It, it, it's it's a different world. Like, like there's nothing from, there's no politicians named in the real world that are named in this book. It's all fictional people. But it's so spot on. And he wrote this book in 2013. And there's a new book that came out, I want to say 2018, called The Every. And it's the sequel to The Circle. I'm going to read it. 
I'll let you guys know how it goes. But uh, the reason why I mentioned the book is just because it it's talking about the things that interest me. It's talking about the things that I've been interested in for a long time and interested, even though I'm interested in it, I haven't spent a lot of time on it. I've, I've, it's like, you're aware of something. You're like, I want to pay attention to that, but I will later. And, and so I've kind of been doing that with my life a lot, you know, uh, I've always done that, I'm sure. But, but the, you know, I didn't know this, what this book was about when I started reading it. My wife, uh, borrowed it from the library and, she was going to read it, but she was already reading a bunch of other books. And so I started reading it and she, she started like a couple weeks, like a week or two after me and, and finished it. I don't know, a week before me, something like that. (laughs) It takes me a little while. Uh, it's not that I'm a slow reader. It's just the amount that I read, you know, the amount of time I have to spend to read. So at the end of reading this book, I feel like I've been doing less and less work. Don't tell anybody. Because I'm like, I want to finish the end of this book. And I'm just like, okay, I'll get to that video later. I'll get to this or that. Let me finish this. And, and so I've been reading a lot lately. And, and reading begets reading. The more you read, the more you want to read. And it's heartbreaking for me because it's like, I just want to, it makes you just want to read all day. It makes you want to do nothing but read. And, you know, we've all known people like that, that uh, I had a friend or I don't know if she, she was a colleague, a colleague in, in high school. Uh I take back friend because we weren't really friends. We just knew each other from literally being in the same class together. We never hung out aside from that. So we were friendly. But she was a a girl that literally, quite literally, was always reading a book. She didn't even do her homework. She didn't do any of the classwork in class that I ever saw. She was always reading a novel. And she just loved to read so much. And I get that. I get that because when I read a really good book, something that's a page turner, something that you want to find out what's happening. That's, that's when reading is so much fun. And that's all you want to do. Like when you have a good book, all you want to do is just keep turning those pages. And like I say, if you don't like to read books, it's probably just because you aren't reading books. And, And I don't like to read books either when I'm not reading books. I like to read books when I'm reading them. So reading begets more reading. Um, privacy, you know, how much, I I don't want to spoil too much of the book or any of the book really, um, but they do talk about, you know, how can you, it's almost like this company wants to know everything there is to know in the world, literally everything, all in the open. And, And I think the takeaway is anything that's that one sided, that I don't know, like lopsided, unbalanced, like only privacy, like giving no information, no communication, that's bad, but also no privacy at all, always communicating, always telling everybody what we're doing, always, you know, here, I'm in my bedroom, I'm in the shower, you know, whatever, you know, it's, there's too much, too much TMI, that's a thing, too much information, right? So I think that's, that's the crux of this book is, how much is too much? It doesn't, it's not saying that these companies are all evil. It, it's saying more like they become evil. You know, it's like the, a great idea can start and become a bad idea. And great intentions, the best intentions can start with the very best intentions and become bad. Um, so, like I said, I am not, I, I try not to be, super one way or super another way because I feel like the answers are both true. There's some answers on each side that are both true. Uh, I'm not talking about good people on both sides, by the way. (laughs) But I'm just saying, like, this thing could be true where, okay, I like my privacy. I like to have some time alone to with my thoughts where people aren't asking me questions or wondering why I'm staring into space, you know. Uh, On the other hand, if you're only... If, if you're only shrouded in secrecy, then it takes a lot longer for us to learn and grow from our mistakes. It takes us, you know, a lot of people will go through life not knowing what somebody else could, could have just told them, um, whatever, whatever it is. I mean, there's, there's truth on both sides is, is what I mean by that, um, between privacy or complete transparency. So, uh, 
So I don't bring this up just to say that all all corporations are evil, although most corporations are more evil than they're not. <laughs> Prove me wrong. I would love for you guys to call in and let me know uh, your thoughts on this. If you've read the book, please call in. The number is 360-830-6660. I'm going to start reading the next one soon. Probably take a little break. I've got Goldfinger coming up and a lot a lot of other things to like tune my brain to. But then I'm going to get back into reading um, reading the, the the second one. So let me know if you if you maybe maybe you haven't read it, but you're going to read it by the time I do another podcast. You can call in. All right, thank you guys, appreciate it. Uh, MXPeaks.com. Thank you for your orders. Still sending out vinyl. It's been amazing. Um, and of course, Goldfinger. Uh, thanks for coming to the shows. Um, I don't know what else to say about that because I haven't done the shows yet. It's kind of it's kind of hard to to say anything, but. Uh, Let's get into a couple voicemails and uh, we'll let you guys have your week. All right? All right. Let's do it. Here we go. Oh, shoot. Here we go. Hey, Mike. It's Jesse from St. Louis. Hey, uh, was wondering if you could give us a little backstory on the MXTX logo. That crazy looking guy or that kid, whatever it is. Um, I guess I could Google it, but... I feel like it'd be more interesting to hear it from your mouth. So, um, yeah, what's up with the logo? Where'd that come from? Cool. Great question. Uh, what's up, Jesse? Um, let me just start at the beginning. When we were working on our first album, Poking At you, we knew we wanted a mascot for the band. Um, and we were already MXPX at the time, although we still, MXPX stood for Magnified Plaid. But... We knew we wanted to have like a punk mascot, somebody, something that was like on the cover, you know, doing something and, and talking to Brandon Ebel from Tooth and Nail Records. He's like, well, I know just the perfect person. And he's like, John Nissen, he just did our logo. He had just done the main Tooth and Nail logo. That's like the square rectangle box and it says Tooth and Nail Records. And so, and he had just done Blenderhead, Blenderhead's first album. Uh, where where it's like a guy going like this and there's a blender on his head. It's so cool. You know, it's just like the coolest. Um, and we're like, yeah, let's have him do something. So I kind of just, I don't, I don't think, I don't remember talking to John on the phone or anything. I don't, I don't rem have that memory. Um, I wonder if John would remember, but I, I assume that it was through Tooth and Nail. Tooth and Nail talked to him, got him going on it. He would send stuff to them. They would send stuff to me. So when we got that first sketch of the Poconacha cover, it was this guy who was like a, a real skinhead looking punk. He looked a lot like uh, uh, Skankin' Punk from Circle Jerks, their logo guy. And it's just like this guy, like it wasn't exactly like the Circle Jerks guy because the Circle Jerks guy is just like skanking and going like that. But this guy that John drew was skinhead and, and his face was scrunched up and he was like mad and and his fist was like in a circle and it was like his, his arms were like done in a weird way to make his body look kind of like a circle and um it wasn't a bad drawing at all but it was not the tone that we were looking for and i and, and as soon as i saw it i was like hmm you know i wanted something more cartoony more upbeat more friendly it could have some angst to it but it should be a, a lighter angst <laughs> and I, I feel like I feel like I said something along those lines and the first thing he came back with after that was the poking at your punk and right away it, there it was a sketch of the record and right away I was like that's it that's exactly what I want now I didn't picture that in my head and then he drew it I, I just was like Make it more cartoony and more, you know, fun. Boom, he did it. And and that's the Poconacha Punk. And the reason we call him the Poconacha Punk is because he first appeared on our first album, Poconacha. So we call him Poconacha Punk, PXPX, Punk Boy, whatever you want to call him, that's fine. Some people call him Spike. Some people call him Spike Boy. But we always called him Poconacha Punk because of the album. And... Our fan club's called PXPX, Poking at Your Punks. All the, the fan club members, all our fans, they're 
they're punks. They're the Poconecha punks. So uh, that's the the history where the name came from and where he came from. And, and from there, you know, we just kept using them. We didn't use them for absolutely everything, you know, uh, teenage politics. And then on life in general, of course, we didn't use him. I wonder what it would have been like if we would have used the Poconecha Punk for every single album cover. That that could have been really cool, you know, and, and it's fine that we didn't, you know, uh, I think we do a lot and now we certainly try to, but uh, again, you know, we weren't necessarily thinking of all of this stuff from a marketing standpoint. We were thinking of it as what would be cool? What would fit us? What is it? What feels right for us? And, and, and to be honest, sometimes you can make the wrong decisions by, by doing what feels right for you, the wrong decisions monetarily or business-wise. But when it comes to your heart and looking back on all these years, thinking, okay, we did what we thought was right, but we also did what we, what we wanted to do. Um, that's beautiful. Like a perfect example would be slowly going the way of the buffalo. We had so many different cover ideas for that. And nothing just seemed right to us. It didn't seem to fit the music. And we could have just said, yeah, just put out like a Boy Scout cartoon guy that has nothing to do with MXPX. And instead we put out a Buffalo picture that was like literally this sort of like archived picture I found in the, you know, the U.S. archives. And I changed it up a little bit and voila, cover, you know. Somebody got paid to do that cover that didn't even do that cover because I did the cover for slowly going the way of the buffalo. But looking back, it's kind of crazy because people love that album and nobody's ever once said the album cover is terrible. And maybe it is terrible. I don't know. I mean, but I think sometimes you get away with stuff like that when it's just you you feel like you're doing what's right. You feel like this is this is how it should be. So, yeah, there's there's the... Hopefully I, I covered I covered the uh, Poconecha Punk story well enough. All right, next one. Hey, Mike, we're big fans of, the, of you and the show, and you have a question. Do you have any advice for bands that are just starting out? Yeah, because we're a punk band. Yeah. I'm from Virginia, and we, we want advice. Yeah, like how to get gigs and stuff. And... and and you're really cool. Yeah. Please, please notice us. All right. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. Thanks for calling in. Virginia Band. One thing you didn't do, first things first, when you call into a, a podcast and you're going to be on the podcast, you have to tell everybody what your band is called and where to find you. So, hey, guys, my band's called MXPX. You can find us at MXPX.com. Follow us on all the socials you know, whatever, like something like that. Now you don't have to like sell yourself all the time. You could have just told me, Hey, Mike calling in. I would love to know what do we do as a new band to gain new audience, to get shows, to put out an album, whatever it is. The band is called blah, blah, blah. That's actually not a bad name for a band. Blah, 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 blah. Or it could be a cool name for an album. Blah, blah, blah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so let me, let me, you know, I, I'm no expert, but, uh, I've been doing it a long time and I do my own stuff. So I think, I think that's what qualifies me to talk about it. But first things first, what's your goals? You know, um, you don't all have to have the same exact goals as band members, but if you have similar goals, it's going to help a ton. So I would say first and foremost, what's the point? Are you guys just friends and wanted to do a band? Well, then your goal is to have fun. Your goal is to learn something. Your goal is to, so whatever it is, I think, I think how you do stuff is you learn how to do it yourself. So how do we get gigs? Sure. Definitely ask around. I'm not saying don't ask me or don't ask people. What I'm saying is you're doing the right thing. Ask, find out, and then do it yourself. So if I was doing the same thing, if I was like, okay, I want, uh, I want my band MXPX to, uh, get some gigs. Ah, a little different. We have a booking agent. We have a history of shows and ticket sales and things like that. So it's not going to be the same process as a, a band that's brand new. So what you got to do is go, okay, one of our goals is to have fun, but another goal is to get gigs. All right. So do you have any recordings of yourself? Um, 
don't go out and record a brand new album. Don't record a full length album. I would, what I would do is record one song, maybe two to three songs at the most. And what I would do is record those as cheaply as possible. Do it for free if you can. If you know somebody that's willing to do it, uh, if you know somebody that has a Pro Tools rig in their bedroom and you can do some some drumming and then like add some samples to that drumming, listen to most punk records these days. It sounds They sound terrible and they're all fake drums and all that. So you can do it yourself is what I'm saying. Like people don't need a studio like we do like with real drums. Um, but getting back into gigs, if you have like one song or something to show people, it's nice, you know, just so they have an idea of where to put you with other bands, um, a similar bill. But make a list of places you've gone to see shows. And if you've gone to see a local punk band play, maybe you should play there if it seems cool. So talk to the local booking agent there or the, the manager at the, at the club and find out how you get a show there. And I would do that to all, all around your town, but also the town's next to your towns and just try to find, you know, three, three places where you can just bounce around three different spots. You can go more after that, but, um, I don't really think you need to spread yourself out when you're beginning. You just really need to concentrate on being a good band. So if you're, if you feel like you can do the shows, you can play the songs, you can perform live, uh, pretty well, then it's time to start, start playing and start doing it. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be perfect. You know, I think there's a, a certain extent to where, you know, people want to wait until they're really, really ready to play live in front of an audience. And I think that's a good idea, but don't use it as an excuse not to give it a shot. Don't use it that as an excuse to like, okay, I have to be perfect before I go play a show. No, you just have to be able to actually get through the show. And, and from there, go for it. Uh, that's what I think. Um, and another thing about just practicing in general as a band, like in practice, one, you're going to sound way better to yourself in practice. Um, and then when you record that and listen back, it's going to sound much worse. You're going to be like, that's what we're doing. Okay. We need some work on that, you know? So, so there's, there's a lot of, a lot of facets and a lot of things to work on as a new band, but let's assume that you're good and that you can, you write songs and you can play them and sing them or whatever it is you, you, you guys do. Um, it's more about networking then and um, hook up and try to become friends with, be cool with other bands that have connections and can get you on a gig. That's another way to get, get gigs. Um, of course, emailing, DMing, all of that is, it's a way a lot of people do book shows, but I would say if you can start, by going face to face and going in and just being like, we're a local band, we're trying to get some gigs, blah, blah, blah. Or, I mean, fake it till you make it and be like, hey, uh, we're a band and uh, we're looking to do some gigging here. <laughs> but I just think face to face is, is better because they can't, they can ignore you technically, but it's much more rude. Now, if you send an email, a DM, easily ignored. And most of the time, it's not even seen. Um, so, and when it is seen, it's going to take, you know, it's going to take a while for people to get back. Um, just imagine being a booking agent at a local punk club and, and imagine all the people that are emailing and texting you and constantly DMing you on all of the social media platforms. It must be insane. So I would love to hear from anybody out there that works in a club, anybody out there that, that works in promotions, that works in marketing, any, any of those things, like, I would love to hear your thoughts on on your experiences, you know, uh, just, it could be anything, to be honest, but uh, call in, call in, call in, it's uh, 360-830-6660, but um, what else, okay, so we get gigs, maybe we got one gig, um, I mean, today, you gotta have, uh, you gotta have your social media accounts, so Find your band name, search it on Google and all the other places, and make sure that it's not, it's not like, my band is called Milk, and then you like put Milk into Google, and it's like a million articles, and you know, you can't do that, you know, you have to like give it something a little more unique, right? So, 
So that's why if your band's called Milk, it's called, you know your your social media is going to be Milk the band or Milk official, Milk band official, whatever. It is. You, you get my gist. Try to find something that is a little off the beaten path or that isn't taken and get it for every single social media platform for your band. I'm sure you probably already have that by now because people usually do that first before they do anything, which I get. Uh, geez, I'm I'm really sorry that I'm not more helpful because everything is just work. It's just leg work, footwork, uh, finger work, dialing that phone. Um, you really just have to treat it like a project that you are in charge of, like which it is, and if you don't do it, no one will. And and that's what I'd say about also management. Like, don't find a manager until you know you've already, you know, you're you're, you're about to do your first or your second or third album. I don't know. I, I don't think we had a manager till our third album. Um. Yeah, I think yeah, maybe on the cover or something, but. Yeah, I think I know. It was it was our third album. After our third album, even we didn't even have a manager before Life in General was released. So that should tell you a little something about how much you need a manager when you're starting out, because it's all unless your manager has serious connections above him or her, uh, you're not. They're not going to do anything for you because a manager at that level is pretty at any level is a secretary, and until that manager creates revenue for you out of thin air by making a deal with somebody that you didn't already know or something like that, that manager is not really doing what a manager is supposed to do. Um, a lot of people think managers are just supposed to like book flights and do that. Now they're, they're very much making sure that stuff's get done, but, but I would say you should be booking your own flights as a band because you're the one that's going on the flight, you know, and, and I've had, for years and years and years and so many years, I had a, uh, we had a travel agent for the for the band, where we would they would do all our flights, everything. Da, 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 da. And after a while, of course, the internet and all that has gotten a lot easier to do it yourself. But I eventually was just like, everybody would complain about this little thing or this little thing or this, and I'm like, you know what, guys, I'm gonna start booking the flights. You let me know, and I know already what we want. I mean, for the most part. But you let me know what you need, and I'll make it happen. And I've started doing that, and voila, it really works. It really makes a huge difference in our happiness, in our contentness, in our, you know, whatever whatever life, life happiness meter. <laughs> I don't know what you call it. But, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, all those types of things, learn to do as a band, learn to do as a human. It's going to make you not only a better band but a better person because you're gonna be like i learned to do all this what because i was in a band and maybe that band doesn't go anywhere but the next band you're in or the next job you're in or the next relationship you're in that'll make a huge difference now back when i started out bands when they got they got signed and they they went on tour around the world and they were doing really well selling records selling tickets um the 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 motor the the mo the you know the motive operandi or whatever was is that how is that how you say it um, the mo was once you're at that level you don't have to work you don't have to do anything you know you just do the show and then get on the bus and chill you know and and there was plenty of years where that's kind of what we did where you know I wasn't editing video or I wasn't um, you know, we would do interviews. I mean, that's part of the work too, but interviews, signings, performances, songwriting, that was that was what what my job was, you know. And then of course, uh o over the years I started learning other aspects of business and 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 what it takes to make the train run. And it takes a lot. It takes a lot more than what I was doing and and you know, that realization is something that I think bands get a little glimpse of much earlier nowadays. Like, if you start a band now, yeah, you're going to have to do everything. If you started a band then, you still have to do everything yourself to a certain point. But once you get to a certain level, it all takes off and you're good and then then you're fine. But 
that doesn't exist anymore here. I think it might exist maybe in the really, really far reaches, you know, like, but even somebody like a Taylor Swift, you see they're constantly working. And yes, she has a, a big team that does a lot of the, she probably doesn't book her own flights, right? But she probably does a lot of things that I didn't do back in the day that she wouldn't have done back in the day. But because today's today and, I, you know, all the technology we have, all everything's connected, the internet, things have changed. So learn to be your own manager, learn to know what you want, learn to guide your band and your look and your perception, the way people see you, learn to guide that in a positive way. And I think that's the, that's the, that's where success is. And, um, stand up for what's right for you. Um, because it's not, you know, we live in such a fractured world. We live in such a, a world full of genre and niche or niche. It's, preference you know it's all about preference a lot of times and yeah there's some there's a few <laughs> main basic ideas that um i think are are not preference i think are are good and bad but aside from those few things um i i, I think we live in a world that's just just never ending never ending choice never ending tributaries that branch off from our main ideas and um it's not a bad or good thing. It's just different than the way it used to be. It's different. It, it's it's like continuing to just splinter to all these tributaries. But um, what that tells me is just embrace embrace your your family, and, and I do consider you guys part of that family. Um, and I and I I don't have any ill will towards people that don't come along with what we're doing. And it's like. I get it. Like everybody's so busy. Um, but there's just so much. So it, it's important for me to sit down and really try to just not go too fast on everything. Cause there's plenty that I'm going on, but it's like, we just, uh, we just got a, a bid on a, a new roof for the studio and, uh, you know, do you, what do you, which one's the right one? Do you pull the trigger on this one? There's like, I know this guy, I know this guy, I don't know this other guy, so he's out. You know, it's like, but it, it's just, there's so many choices. And, and so for me, for me, realizing that it's okay now and again to slow down because that's, I, I don't know, I, I don't mind slowing down now and again. Now, and I'm not talking about music, <laughs> I'm talking about, I'm talking about my thoughts and how fast thoughts are coming in and out. And I don't know if you guys wake up in the mornings, but, um, well, of course you wake up in the mornings. What I mean is, I don't know if you guys wake up in the morning and have negative thoughts, but that's a very natural thing. I think I talked about this a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, but it is a very natural thing for us as humans to have negative thoughts in the morning. I don't know what, I think it's a chemical thing. It's we've scrubbed all of our, our brain as we slept and that's all kind of dissipating all the things. And, and now it's like we, you wake up and you, and I, I also, all of a sudden I start worrying a little bit about what it is that's not done um, and what I need to do today. And a lot of times it's things that I literally can't do right this second. Like I'm not going to get up and start working on this thing. Like I'm going to do it tomorrow or I'm going to do it this afternoon, but it still makes you worry. It still gives you that tightness, you know, it's probably different for, for different people. But for me, it's almost like a tightness in my chest and I frown and I frown. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. Wow. Blah, blah, blah. Right. Good name for a record. All right, call back in. Let us know what your band is called and where we can find you. And if you're not ready for all that, call back in and say, we don't even have a band name. What are some, what are some good ideas? Maybe we can help you find a band name. Would love to. I have like, um, what I do is anytime I come up with ideas like blah, 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 I don't know if I'll do that one, but I'll write it down in my phone. I'll write like voice memos and be like, da, 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 and possible album title possible song title you know song titles album titles band 
possible band name, things like that. It's fun. All right, one more, one more voicemail and uh, call it a day. Thank you, guys. Hey, what's up, Mike? It is Gideon. Uh, what are we going? Shake the memory tree. You played my 29th birthday about seven years ago almost now. It was a private show in a small town in Illinois. And then I caught you uh, about a year later almost at the Triple Rock with Mass Intruder, and I brought their meatball subs that they demanded. And then the next night I was at the Tinley Park for the 350 Fest. Uh, good times. 350 Fest was great. Picked up my favorite MXPX hoodie there and uh, was wearing that and standing back behind the merch table talking to you for, like, a good 30 minutes. And when I went back to, like, the beer tent to get some beer, guy pointed to my sweatshirt, said something about MXPX that I didn't hear. I said, yeah. And then he handed me back my, my drink tickets, and nobody took drink tickets me for me the rest of the evening. And I realized it's because they asked if I was with the band. Uh that was cool, and then going, hanging out the after party with you guys afterwards was neat too. Me and the drummer of Bayside arguing over who liked Chinese food more. <laughs> anyway, uh, just thought I'd shout out and say hey because uh, haven't done this since you started posting that number. So keep doing what you're doing, man. Rock on. Haha, <laughs> Gideon. Yes, I remember, dude. It was so cold that night. And I remember that was a trip where I was on a solo. T- I don't know if I like was on a tour and then I ended it. And I think that's what it was. But anyway, thanks for having me at your house. It was awesome. Um, Brian Bouchelt was at that show. Uh, Jake Langley was my driver for that show. And uh, it was a cool party. It was a cool party. And I remember hanging out with you at 350 Fest that was so much fun. Um, yeah, 350 Brewing, great great company out of South Chicago. Um, wish them the best still, you know. That's funny that you got free drinks the whole time because they thought you were with us, which is, which is great. You know, you should get free drinks. Uh, Triple Rock, for those that don't know, that jogged my memory a little bit, shook my tree. Um, yeah, the Triple Rock closed. It's in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we played a show there. I don't know, a few, quite a few years ago now, but um, it was awesome. I, I love that place. Tumbledown had played there before, so I was kind of familiar with it. And uh, Mast Intruder, we did this promo where it was like us and Mast Intruder, and they called, and they were, we were like, they were keeping something f- held for ransom or something like that, and uh, they wanted two meatball subs or something like that as ransom. And it, it was just a joke, really, but I'm so glad that somebody actually did. I remember that somebody did that, but I didn't remember that it was you, Gideon, which is even better. Um, you're a trooper. You're a, a team player. You're a sport. I love it. And and that's probably why, you know, you being so cool was why we allowed you to hang out at the after party, uh, the after show party at 350 Fest. Because you are a guy that's easy easy enough, even though you're a big fan, you're, you're totally cool, <laughs> even though, like, that's not a bad thing. But, uh, you were cool, man. You were you were fun to hang out with. You you didn't be all you weren't all weird. You were like fun and happy, and I think that's the key. If you ever come up and want to hang out with us, just don't be weird. Be fun and happy. And if you're weird, that's cool too. We love you anyway, because <laughs> I'm a weirdo a lot. Believe me, I get weird, you know, sometimes. But um, we all do socially, right? We do. We do. That's just the way it is. And um, sometimes it's weird, you know, when you, you think, you know, you think, you know, somebody so well, like, like me talking on this podcast all the time. Um, you do know me, you do know me pretty well, but it doesn't mean I know that, you know, I'm not thinking that all the time when I'm out there talking to people. So I just try to play it real cool, play, play it chill. Um, <laughs> I didn't know you like Chinese food more than the drummer of Bayside. <laughs> A little Chris, but uh, good. I mean, because I'm pretty sure he likes Chinese food a lot. Um, I don't know what's. I'm trying to think what else, but I just rem- you know what I remember aside from your your party was leaving your party. Um, we were driving. I don't know. We were driving kind of far. I think we were driving to to Pennsylvania that night. I could be wrong. 
could be wrong because we were in Illinois, so maybe we weren't driving all the way to Pennsylvania. But I just remember having to take a leak after we left uh, your house, and we were on some main street, main road, and there was a big parking lot, and it was freezing. I don't think it was snowing, but it may it it basically was cold enough to snow, and it was just a really weird stormy situation. And I got out and I like peed on the side of a building. Yeah. And, and then we left town, but uh, <laughs> we made it. Thank you guys so much uh, for your calls. If you want to call in, please do, 360-830-6660. And shout out to Bob McKnight for producing and doing what he does for the podcast, editing, all that. His podcast is called The Bob and Katie Show. Um, you can catch it anywhere you, you hear podcasts. This one, too. Um, would love... Would love uh, would love you guys to let me know whether you listen on video or do you listen on the actual podcast apps. Um, because if you don't listen on video, if nobody's watching on video, maybe I don't need to put out a video every week because that's just, you know, not necessary. You tell me. We're going to do a survey. Something that's been big, a big part of that book, The Circle, that I was talking about at the beginning of the show, was they do this this like company wide survey where everybody has to vote for something. So you guys let me know YouTube. Yes or no. Do you want me to keep doing video? If it's not necessary, then why do it? Right. If nobody's watching, why bother? That's it. That's what I want to know. And until next time and where to put it, I don't know, wherever you're listening to this, wherever you usually see uh, the podcast stuff, whether it's Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, one of those. Check them all out. All right. Until next time, you guys, have a great week, a great next week, and uh, I'll hear from you on the phone call. Cheers. Cheers.